Assalamu alaikum. Forty years ago, I used to climb up the stairs much quicker than that. <laughs> and it's quite extraordinary that uh, young people have come and shown an interest in this project, which did affect so many people's lives. I'm often coming upon people of my generation who were inspired by it and who it was affected. But for myself, it was absolutely life-changing. Because you see, the festival was like a river. It started as a little stream. And then the streams were added to each other and it turned into a, a small river. And then it turned into a bigger river because other rivers joined it. And then in this massive way, by 1976, it joined the sea and entered into so many people's lives in so many different ways. For me, I witnessed the spring, that point right up in the mountains where the water comes out from the ground, the beginnings of the idea. It was to do with a meeting. I was a child of the 60s. I was in my 20s during the 60s, rebelling against the norms of society in the radical avant-garde. And one day I met a traditional musician from India. And this completely transformed my life. One year later, I was totally absorbed in this beautiful world that had been opened to me. What I'd been involved in was like a, a stagnant pond compared to a great ocean. And I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand where this miracle, this beauty of art came from. So I organized a small festival, first of all in America at Brandeis University, and then at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, to understand the culture out of which this glorious music was born. The courts of Mughal India. And then I had the great inspiration of my life. I was given a view of something. And that was that I knew something about Moorish Spain. And Ustad Mahmud Mirza was opening up to me the miracles of Muslim India. And I could see that nothing connected them excepting Islam. They were two completely different worlds, languages, <coughs> cultures, ethnologies. So I hurried to the Institute of Contemporary Arts, where during my years dealing with modern art and culture, I had many friends, and I proposed to them a World of Islam festival. This was 1971. And this festival was there to celebrate that unity, that geometry, that calligraphy, that movement, that pattern, that rhythm that went from one end of the Islamic world to the other. Through the visual world, through music, through the movement of the Mevlevi. And for the first time, we brought this glorious Turkish group to London. And the exhibition focused on understanding the patterns, analyzing them. The festival was a great success in 1971. Princess Margaret opened it. It was very well received by the press. There was one problem, and that was that six months before the festival took place, the ICA got into financial trouble and they withdrew the funds from the festival. So I had to raise the money. And when the festival was over, 
There was a hole of 10,000 pounds, which today is an enormous sum of money. I was in a real problem. I had the great crisis on my hands. And it so happened that in January 1972, my brother got married to a Swiss lady. And one week before the wedding, I went to Switzerland and I spent a week dealing with this crisis. What should I do? I asked myself the question, is the World of Islam Festival a good idea? And the answer that came back was, yes, it's a good idea. But it's got to be done at the top level. It's got to engage all the institutions. It's got to engage all the different media. It is the most important idea, but it must be presented magnificently. And Her Majesty the Queen must open it. So encouraged by this, I came back to London. And the first thing in 1972 I did was to go to the institutions. And I chose the Arts Council of Great Britain because the Arts Council of Great Britain was the central body. And I went to them. And they were very, very positive about the idea. I said to them, the Arts of Islam should be an exhibition at the center of a great festival involving the institutions. And they liked the idea, but they said there's one problem. And that is that the chairman of the exhibitions committee doesn't like Islamic art. <laughs> and if it comes up before him, it's likely to be turned down. But, they said, in one year's time, he is going to retire, and then we will have the committee, and we can get it through. I had a big problem on my hands. How was I to maintain this 10,000 pound hole for, for a whole year? So what I did was I then started to go to all the other institutions. I went to the Science Museum and I said, if the uh, Arts Council agree to do the central exhibition of the Arts, will you do the Sciences of Islam? And then I went to the British Library, will you do the Holy Quran? And then to the Museum of Mankind, because he developed this idea of nomad and city. And then the VNA and the BM for their great collections to put on special exhibitions. And then the Horniman Museum, which had a great collection of musical instruments. And then the Commonwealth Institute, because somebody had come up with this wonderful idea of the Hausa of northern Nigeria. And then I went to Suez and started to get the, the, the universities involved. And after one year, the gentleman retired. The new chairman came. And it was passed, and the Arts Council accepted the exhibition and invested a considerable sum of money for its realization. And we had got, by the beginning of 1973, a huge commitment from all the major institutions in London for this project. And then, in October 1973, throughout 1973, I was working on establishing the body, the trust, that would be the focal point to hold everything together, to carry the vision. And in October 73, an extraordinary things happened. It was an amazing month, because first of all, the trust was established in law. And there are two, and there is a very special man, the Raja of Mahmudabad, who was the director of the Islamic Cultural Center. And we're standing in front of the, the, the foundation stone of the new mosque. And Raja was such a support from 1972 right through. Whenever I had trouble, he used to say, you put the seed in the ground, you water it, but you can't. You have to leave it to Almighty Allah. And remember, I wasn't a Muslim at this time. I wasn't a Muslim. And he was so kind and so supportive and very much a man who understood the world and understood the Muslim world. But the great tragedy 
was that in October 1973, he died at the age of 59. And God bless him, because this man was a man of, of God. He was a beautiful man. And the festival and all those who benefited from it owe a great debt to him. And there were two other key people at this time. Professor Yusuf Ibish, a man who had such knowledge, had such wisdom about the world of Islam, and whose guidance at this time was absolutely critical. And Alistair Duncan, who had a tremendous knowledge and insight into the establishment, because we needed the establishment. And he had a great love of the Muslim world. He was a wonderful photographer. And he became the administrator of the festival. And then when the festival finished, he then became the director of what continued as the World of Islam Festival Trust and then became the Al Tajir Trust. And with these people, the trust was formed. The third thing that happened in October 1973 was that suddenly oil quadrupled, more than quadrupled, suddenly it went up. Look at the, look at the line, that first line. And suddenly, the Arabs had huge money. And we needed money. <laughs> and Almighty Allah just organized. This is why he did it. <laughs> For this moment. And then the trust, under the chairmanship of Sir Harold Bailey, went and started going to raise the funds to match the huge investment that the British institutions were making. And also, to start the process of negotiating with the Arts Council of Great Britain, the loan of 6,000 objects from 250 public and private collections from 32 different countries. And the members of the trust split up and went and uh, covered this whole area with an amazing work by the trustees. One meeting, early meeting, with the foreign minister and the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates. Alison Duncan and myself presented. A week later, the ambassador called me up and said, we have decided to contribute half a million pounds to your project and to guarantee a further half a million. But believe you me, the scale of what was happening meant that we had to continue very hard to raise money right up until the very end. But this was the absolute cornerstone that gave us the strength and the power to be able to then unleash a project of extraordinary scale. 1974, the whole scholastic community the whole community of curators, librarians, and scholars set to work in a big way. Already the institutions were involved, but by this time the scholars were involved. And an army was working on this. I once counted 200 people who were working on the program. Titus Burkhardt and Said Hussein Nasr were very important in the festival. They understood that unity, that, in that, that, that whole, wholeness, and looking at it from an Islamic perspective, not from the outside. And then in 1976, the festival opened. The programs, the exhibition programs, there were 12 official exhibitions and about 20 others around the country. The Trust published 15 books, and there were more than 50 books that came out at the time to coincide with it. There were 20 great musical uh, performances, and there was a tremendous educational program of lectures, seminars, 
and schools programs. And going through it, there was a film series which was shown by the BBC twice and which covered the major themes of the festival and, in a sense, held it together. And so, on the 8th of April, 1976, Her Majesty the Queen inaugurated the festival and before that, on the 2nd, the Sheikh al Azhar had inaugurated the Quran exhibition. And this glorious feast of beauty was there for all of London and all the visitors to see. Wonderful environmental exhibitions. The exhibition of, of Sana, the city, and the one of the Hausa was so beautiful because the beautiful uh, environments were created. And finally, a feast of music took place to show that the beauty, the elevating aspect of music is not foreign to Islam. It carries you up. It's a part of the, of the, of the, of the refinement of the soul. And so the press cuttings, which you will have seen, you have seen out there, a huge press coverage. Every subject was discussed. It created a tremendous live discussion and presentation. And a few years ago, I handed the four volumes of the press cuttings uh, to the library at Cambridge University. So many people's lives were touched. But for me personally, it was my journey to Islam. Because six months before the festival opened, I became a Muslim. And then I made my pilgrimage at the end of 1976. And I then disappeared <laughs> into the glorious Ummah of Islam. Thank you so much.